So this is the key question that informed this talk. Um, and it brings together two of our research projects. The first one, and it's the broader team, of course, of which we're a part, um, the Cold Rush and Beyond. And that was the one that focused on, uh, from the ethnographic perspective, uh, the um, impact of new coal mine developments in local rural communities, um, in, in Chagasgar, in uh, New South Wales, and uh, in Lausitz, in, in Germany. And then the second one is the one we're doing now, sorry, I'll just go back. And that's uh, looking at um, decarbonising electricity and renewable energy um, in the issue of sociological relations. It's also a comparative study across the three countries nationally, but also ethnographically in specific local areas. So the questions that we're interested in um, are trying to cross over between these two sets of uh, concerns. And the first one is about uh, community opposition, which has been very evident in, in, in both cases. One, of course, is still in early days, the renewable energy. The other one is a finished project. But does it create uh, a more receptive space when communities oppose coal mines uh, for the transition to renewable energy? Is there new forms of awareness about other options, uh, climate change, emissions reductions, sustainability, etc., that come out of often very fierce battles with coal that these uh, communities can study have? And then that leads into the issue of social legitimacy. Um, does it gain social legitimacy because it's not connected to climate change? And one of the things that we'll talk about is the rather ambiguous uh, relationship to climate change that a lot of the opposition has in these local areas. And then the third one is the concerns about enabling a just transition to renewable energy. Not the communities themselves necessarily talk in those terms of just transition, but there is often a sense of uh, wanting fairness, wanting equity, wanting to avoid social division and greater inequality. So you can sum that up in a way, I suppose, or just transition. So our methods were ethnographic and they tie in and articulate with the methods that other members of the research uh, team uh, undertook, including Stuart Rosemont, of course, who's not here, political economy, um, James, and others. Uh, so we've really been going now for reflecting about six years. And the work is participant observation and interviews and all the other sorts of ways that anthropologists or ethnographers create a wider context for understanding local community action. And the comparative framework has been very important and we think one of the most interesting aspects of our study. And they were the things that we felt were in common, our coal dependency, uh, the states in each case are heavily involved in coal extraction, and uh, democratic politics. So just to turn to uh, the area where I worked with Beck Pez for several years, uh, this is the Liverpool Plains area in New South Wales. You can just see the, this is on, I can show you the, maybe I'll just use this, yeah, here we are. Here we are there in part of New South Wales, northwest it's called. Um, these are the two proposed mines that were uh, in, the, in the pipeline in, uh, when we went in 2014, the Kaluna mine, the Watermark, Watermark mine. Uh, and I'm just getting ahead of myself there. So two large mines, and one the Kaluna, uh, BHP Billiton, and the other one the state-owned Genoa Corporation, the Watermark mine. Uh, and, and things had started there very much in the heyday of the coal boom in New South Wales uh, in 2006. The state started to hand out exploration licenses like uh, candy to just about any multinational company that came along, really, uh, often without very good tender processes. So there was a lot of opposition. This is an area, I think you can see from the map, it's a pretty fertile area, uh, some of the best agricultural land uh, in the country. And uh, it's a sort of floodplain of the Namoi River. And there'd never been any coal. There's coal further out on more marginal land uh, up, up, up here. Um, coal mines, smaller coal mines, but nothing ever 
come there, and people felt a bit protected because they were such a prosperous agricultural region. For the Gomeroi, uh, one of the biggest indigenous groups uh, in, in uh, New South Wales, um, they of course have a history of dispossession and um, all the things that went along with the very original process of settlement in the 19th uh, century. Um, but again, um, they felt uh, very strong connections to their ancestral country, heritage sites, and so on. So this was the sort of stances that opponents took uh, over the long period, and the main uh, thread of the landowner's opposition to the mine, which was extremely uh, strong, uh, although of course there were landowners that sold out early and made a, a packet, but most were trying to hang on and stop the mine. So it was all about land use change, loss of water, that is loss of livelihoods, and uh, way of life. And their slogan was long line, wrong place. They often said things like, we don't oppose coal. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's all about our place. We don't want this mine here. Um, and the Gomeroi of course lost of irreplaceable land and heritage. And they, you know, they, they say typically things like, you can't take, you know, artifacts or slices of binding stones or anything out of this country. It belongs in this context. It's part of the sentience of this, our land. They see it all as sentient. And so you can't shift it somewhere else. It's already destroyed if you do that. So they were fighting for something they felt was absolutely irreplaceable, incommensurable with any form of compensation that could ever be offered. So this is just a couple of shots to give you a sense of what was going on then. Um, that was in the main street of Gunnedah, the original town. And that's just a picture of the countryside. Coal mine going through, coal train going through, uh, ridge lands at the back, which were catchment for the, for the underground aquifers that made this area so fertile and why the water was so important. And uh, a big sorghum field, that was one of the key crops at that time, much of it going to China to make a liquor for Bajai. Um, so the question, I guess, you know, we put it in a rather academic framework how to destabilize the Liverpool Plains coal commodity. They put it in other frameworks, frameworks like how to stop this bloody coal mine, or these two bloody coal mines. And they developed a, a number of modes of contestation, quite pragmatic, quite fluid. I wouldn't say there was a big strategy behind it, so things emerged and they were very opportunistic. So communicating the value of place to decision makers and public, uh, there were organisations that were developed or strengthened early in the day, the Karuna Coal Action Group, all the farmers contributed, they raised about a million bucks just out of farmer contributions, and that was for submissions, it was for all sorts of um, expenses that members um, incurred, and they would have, um, you know, make submissions, they would try and get interviews with people in the New South Wales government, there would be pit stops uh, whenever a poly came to town at the airport, there'd be a mob of the uh, Karuna Coal Action Group people there asking the hard questions to this trapped politician and so on. So they were very good at, um, at, at that sort of thing. Um, also, the Gomeroy had, of course, the big network of New South Wales Aboriginal land rights, uh, local area councils, so they had that force behind them. And whenever an announcement was made, the EI was out, or you know, some other sort of uh, milestone, they would be there. And, and so that was a public phase. And then there were all sorts of situational alliances and actions, and they were very expedient uh, in the context of the struggle. Um, you know, things like the Greens would ally with the farmers to sort of put on a, some sort of action or festival. Gomeroy allied with farmers. Farmers helped them with submissions to defend their heritage to the to the um, to the minister in you know certain sorts of uh, appeals that they could make. So these things were going on all the time. Most of them fairly transient but very important um, and had a lot of resonance in a particular context at a particular time. And then there were legislative challenges and, the re and attempts to re-regulate coal in a more favourable way uh, with the state as a mediator between society and capital. <coughs> uh, the results are just <coughs> the mine was withdrawn, the BHP mine was withdrawn, the Shemai mine is still not constructed. So there's a fair bit of su success, we have to say in terms of that particular struggle. This is just moving to renewable energy very quickly because I can see my 10 minutes is up. Um, but you can see the boom in renewable energy in New South Wales has been so recent 
So even as these uh, struggles against the coal mines have been going on for 10 years, really 2016 was when renewables started to take off, both wind and solar in New South Wales, including not so much right in the Liverpool Plains, but all around it. And that's where we've been studying with Beck Pierce some of those issues. So it's really massive to think that much has happened, up to 14,000 megawatt capacity potentially uh, in just three years. And it actually spreads across different regions. So there's a shift actually in, in, in energy, and it's a bit like what was just said, you know, some areas in the country inside are actually concentrated in coal, <coughs> other areas are going to be the places where renewable energy takes up. Um, and there's lots of issues, there's lots of benefits. So some of the ways that people are benefiting are income diversification, if you're lucky enough to get a solar farm or a wind turbine on your property. Neighbours get small payments, local councils benefit, local businesses get a bit more business, and company or uh, community organisations get donations. But of course there's all sorts of other downs. Um, displacement of land, land use change, <coughs> scarcity of water, all the negative biophysical aspects, land price distortions, uh, division and, and, and envy and so on between neighbours, all sorts of health noise and flickering amenities, visual and heritage, boom and bust sort of economy, construction brings lots of work and there's not much employment when it goes, psychosocial distress. So, Okay. So the India part of this, um, which we'll go through very, very uh, briefly, um, the work was carried out in South India. Um, sorry, that's probably not an acceptable amount of misconception. But it was, it's basically where that is, and then in that district over there. Um, the field work was mostly, mostly between 2014 to 2016 um, in three villages. Um, two of them, Sali and Katara, were particularly affected by the Aparasadi state of Assam line and its extensions. So I was assisted in this field work, uh, work partners in this field work were Kanji Kodi and Mandu Menon, who is here. And um, so basically, in this particular context, um, there had been some, um, how to put it, uh, uh, some agreement to certain uh, uh, mining at, at a point in this area, but there were a large scale number of grievances about the way in which the company Adani went about uh, carrying on or structuring this mine. The grievances the villagers had were around compensation and rehabilitation, uh, which were manifestly inadequate. Um, often they were non-existent for the land that had been acquired for mining. Land acquisition itself was often unsafe, illegal or coerced, and contrary to the vision of the ground Sabha. So this is me talking about the pro visa pro uh, FRA acts, and um, we can talk a lot about how ground Sabha consents were, were often forged or illegally acquired, or you know those those kinds of ways of getting around. Uh, uh, getting the grounds for consent for land acquisition. And also the socio-ecological changes caused by mines. So the pollution of waterways, the impact on wildlife, and um, this population here, which I should have said before, is, is mainly forest dwelling Adivasis, and their slogan was uh, Jal Jangal Zami, you know, so water, land, and forest. And, and it was uh, 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 this soci sociological change is brought, uh, brought about, the ecological change is brought about by the mines. And the pollution and, and, and wildlife was another sort of like major way in which um, um, yes. so was another of their their needs. <coughs> So one of the things was very much about their constitutional rights, not only through the schedule of the constitution, but through the rights granted to them by PESA and by the FRA. So withholding of consent at the grounds of a level, applying for individual and community forest rights, 
another thing was also very much about their culture, tradition, and heritage. And so um, I think I was reminded of this just now, it's not over there by what you said about the Gomeroi, but uh, some of the uh, Adivasis who had been displaced from the land had to move their gods. And they actually uh, said that, that their bad luck or their, their misfortune was because their gods had to leave the forest and had to be removed from where they had been before. Um, they also contested their um, uh, environmental other violations before the National Green Tribunal, as we think uh, we know, said yesterday. They fought malfeasance and misappropriation in the courts. And of course, there were civil actions, protest meetings, demonstrations, participation in panchayat elections, and alliance building at state and national level. So the top picture is a picture of a uh, village that we visited, and uh, sometime later, that village was um, destroyed for the mine, and you can see people being forced out of their houses uh, by the police. And this is sort of the, uh, one of the demonstrations um, you know, uh, against the Parsa mine. Um, so, the, so the thing about the opposition, I think, was that that all of these were parallel. I mean, the people who were working there, the Adivasis and other sort of you know um, activists, they actually did every single one of those things. So it wasn't one in favor of the other. It was kind of parallel action on every level and um, you know, fighting on, on various fronts. A lot of expenditure of energy and a constant level of having to meet new new problems, new sort of objections. So it was a really, it's, it's, it's been a really intense and very sort of um, um, tiring, exhausting kind of process for the people there. About uh, the solar plant, so the place uh, we've been working in Patara along with Priya, and Priya sort of talked a bit about this yesterday. So in the Tumpu district in Patara, it's uh, on 13,000 acres. This is one of the views you can see, and if you take a video, you can just keep driving in a car, and it just goes on and on and on and on. It's a really like, quite impressive, you know, uh, huge uh, installation. Some of this we have already talked about, so I'll go through it very quickly. So there's 13,000 acres of land that's leased by many private players. That's sort of one of them, for example, is Ratan India is one of the ones. Um, the, the villagers who have leased this land, including the wealthy villagers who are actually probably quite happy with their, uh, you know, with what the income that they earn, but none of them actually have copies of the lease documents. So we actually don't, they don't actually know what is in the lease documents and what will happen when the lease period is over and the land reverts to them, one assumes, but, but whether the land will revert to them in a remediated, you know, condition, with all of the, the solar panels removed, will the solar panel be recycled? But there's not, no knowledge of what's kind of going on there, you know, what will happen at the end of the period. Infrastructure was promised, and again, I think we had talked about this yesterday, the notion of identity. One of the things that the people there said, and this was the, the people who had rented their land out, was that, who are we now? You know, we are no longer farmers. We are no longer, we have money, and that's not our issue, but who are we, you know? And they have a welfare association, and it's not so much them that they worried about because they have a history of farming and agriculture. It's their children. Because who are the children going to be? They're no longer going to be farmers. This place is about four, four and a half hours drive from Bangalore. There are no what they consider suitable English medium schools which would enable their children to be able to go out and work in the cities and, and find new identities for themselves and new work lives for themselves. I mean, so money here is not so much the issue as as a fact that they have now, uh, they're now sort of wondering who they're going to be, you know. I mean, people ask them, what do you do? There really is no answer except, you know, I belong to a family which makes a lot of money from, you know, from solar, from renting out to solar. So all of, so the infrastructure like the schools, colleges, dispensaries have not materialized, even though this money has come. And, and as, you know, Priya said, we, the end of the lease, the land is now covered with iron rods and concrete, and, and the remediation cost will be huge. And whether, in fact, it will be remediated, you know, one doesn't know because we don't know what the document says, the lease document says, so we have no idea. So this is what you can see the rods. I think I put this picture here because you can actually see what, and that is only a very small part of, of, um, of you know, the 
13,000 acres that we're talking about here. So, so what? So what conclusions do we come to? So one of them is that if renewable energy transition is driven by neoliberal economic frameworks, then similar problems arise because local communities are not do not participate in energy governance. And this actually works against a just energy transition. Um, and the paradox of democratic energy governance is that if you have a more inclusive approach and try and involve everybody local in that in, in setting up uh, of democratic structures of energy governance, this may not be fast enough for effective climate change action. And, and we always know that you know India is always kind of going, well, China does this, for example. And one of the reasons that China doesn't have to worry about dem democracy, they don't have to worry about taking the people along with them. You know? And as soon as you have to have democratic governance, you actually, you know, you, you stretch the time because you have to consult, you have to take into account, you have to come to an accommodation, you have to have consensus, you know, all of those things which take time. So it may not be fast enough because in climate change terms, we're really talking now, we're really at the peak, you know, where we have to either do things really quickly or we may tip over that point. And the paradox is that the speedier transition, if that is to happen, may not in fact be democratic or inclusive. So you're at the sort of like aspects of this rather with the problem. So I think the, the questions that we've been asking, and as, you, as we, we've said, we're actually halfway through the uh, renewable energy project, and is how do you achieve a just transition in this particular kind of framework? Now we've seen that the civil resistance with coal, and as I said, there have been innovative forms of resistance to coal, both in Australia and in, in India. There have been parallel and uh, uh, incredibly robust forms of resistance, of activism, of, of uh, various ways to try and um, stop uh, injustice and, and, and all other forms of, of oppressive practices. But they may not be enough for, the, for this renewable energy conundrum because of the time factor. And as well now, we have many other challenges. So our limits of information. So you know, for example, you know, the, the, the lease documents of the villagers. I mean, you know, one can put in an RTI, but what will we get? Will we get anything? Will the RTI, in fact, uh, uh, bring up anything that we can use? The, um, also, the fact is when we talk about climate change at both in the, the Adivasi in the coal mine areas of the people in Tungur, it it is seen as sort of a low priority. People are very polite and will listen to you, but what their major concerns really are is, in, is land alienation. It's uh, you know, rights being taken away. It's, it's local, it's those local issues of dispossession of, you know, of those kinds of things. Climate change is, is not something which is a high priority locally. And often it's also a polarized political issue. I mean, in Australia it certainly is. And so it is here. I mean, there's a recognition of climate change, but whether people will actually do anything about it is another question altogether, or at the speed at which, it, which, which we require for it to be done. There's a resistance of established powers. And there's also, I think, finally, there's paradoxical or contradictory consequences of actions. You know, so one, and, and, and the constant you know, the necessity to keep fighting. So, so the, the say, for example, the victory that, that was there for the Dongria Cones in, in Niamdui, but you can already see that there's already sort of like incursions into that space by sort of like uh, similar players. And, you, and, and the, that resistance has to keep on going on. You know, it's, it's not like you can just go, OK, we won. This is, we can relax on this one. This so we were talking about um, this and thinking that along with the old modes of, of resistance that we just Google, that we uh, delineated in both Australia and in India, we may also need what we call a politics of bricolage. And in, in India, we might call it something like a jugar politics. You, know, you use what you have at hand. And the actions and alliances that you make may be short-lived. They may bring together people who would otherwise not be in alliance, but who work together in the moment 
for a particular, you know, particular issue, for a particular goal, for a particular objective, and to use what is there locally in the moment along with the other forms, because we are actually in, in entering, I think, what Ashwini and Partha talked about, a very disruptive moment in, in socio-economic sort of, uh, in the socio-economic arena, where the old forms of resistance may no longer be enough. Um, so this is something we, we, we probably need to think about a bit more about, you know, something we're just throwing out there for your comment. 